Oh, okay. This key, shall I just give it to you? I'm yeah, yeah. afraid that I will just take it uh, off with me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, start. Okay. Okay. Good morning. So we'll uh, get started. So uh, this this will be the third lecture of the series. So. Okay, so we were uh, looking at uh, the linear viscoelastic response uh, of uh, a few material systems and uh, we uh, looked at uh, a system where uh, you have a plasticizing action of the solvent uh, which uh, changes uh, the glass transition and uh, therefore the uh, the temperature at which you see this uh, transition from the rubbery to the glassy phase. And uh, in the rubbery phase itself, uh, uh, how the uh, G prime is as a function of uh, the cross link uh, density. Uh, is uh, uh, worked out based on uh, uh, theories for rubbers and uh, so what's known is uh, for a cross link system uh, g prime uh, will vary uh, directly uh, with the cross link density or the number of cross link points so in this uh, the r is the cross linking ratio this is some uh, work done by jacob in our lab uh, a few years ago where uh, it's a polysaccharide pectin, uh, which is there in plant uh, species. Uh, the peel of uh, uh, oranges or apple, many, many fruits, a lot of plant systems have this biopolymer. And uh, it can be cross-linked uh, because it has uh, COOH groups. And then there is uh, calcium also present. And so with uh, this uh, calcium, these uh, uh, carboxylic acid groups on the polymer chain can be cross-linked and uh, you obtain two different types of cross-links. Uh, at some cross-linking ratio, you obtain what are called these single point cross-links. And uh, you also have what are called these egg box type. Those red uh, are the calcium ions and uh, basically pectin chains and subsequent uh, carboxylic group on pe pectin chains get cross-linked and you get basically an egg box kind of a structure. Eggs which are contained in pectin chains. And so at uh, low R, you have uh, uh, basically a behavior which is uh, given by this kind of egg box. So egg boxes are formed whenever you have less calcium in the system. And uh, single point cross-links are formed uh, whenever you have uh, a uh, very high amount of calcium in the system. And so uh, what you can see is when you look at this uh, scaling of uh, G prime uh, with cross-linking ratio, it corresponds very well with uh, the what's known for rubber, where it's directly proportional uh, to the number of cross-links that are present. Because as I said, R is the cross-linking ratio. So therefore, that's just the amount of, uh, how much is the amount of calcium we are adding in the system. So as we increase calcium, the G prime goes up proportionally. But in, at low concentrations where you have these egg box kind of structures, uh, this R cube scaling is what we see. And uh, this has been observed for many semi-flexible networks. So networks where uh, stretching of polymer chains uh, basically is finitely extensible and the force in the chain increases uh, with the amount of stretching. And so there, uh, the G prime increase is much more uh, 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 pronounced. And so what you can see is, depending on the type of crosslinks that's there, so the egg boxes are basically working like providing semi-flexibility to the chains of the polymer network. And so therefore, you see different scalings when you have egg box bundles, and you have different scalings when you have single point crosslinks. So uh, of course, we did uh, analysis of this in using neutron scattering also to ensure What's the length scale in the system when you have smaller values of R and when you have larger values of R, what's the length scale in the system and so on. But this is something well known about uh, the nature of cross-linking in these systems. 
So we can observe basically the linear viscoelastic response completely changing based on the types of crosslinks for this particular system. And so, yeah. So, uh, regarding the last slide, so yeah. uh, actually the polymer is flexible, right? Uh, uh, so, yeah, so in uh, the polymer also has uh, uh, some amount of semi flexibility because okay. there are these COOH groups and uh, uh, that ionizes. So, it's uh, a okay. anionic uh, polymer. And I see. Uh, so that also has uh, uh, some rigidity, some rigidity, rigidity associated with it. Okay. And when you are telling that these egg box structures are forming, so yeah. they like the effective semi flexibility is increasing. Increasing, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So that is why we see a transition from uh, an R cubed kind of a scaling, uh -huh. which has been observed for semi flexible systems, okay. to an R scaling, which is uh, observed yes. for more uh, okay. flexible kind of mm -hmm. scaling. Okay. I mean, this is a depiction which is uh, not really correct. I mean, there is a the dangling chain between crosslinks is fairly long. The purpose of this is just to show that there is a single point crosslink versus uh, egg box kind of crosslinks. And so the the primitive model, yeah. No, I just wanted to know that because you are increasing the cross-link ratio. Uh, yeah. So, ideally, what I uh, one should expect that egg uh, egg box kind of region that might grow, but instead of that, actually single point crosslinks that develops. Yeah. Uh, do you have any understanding why it is that uh, egg box region is not growing? It's separating to a single point. Yeah, yeah. So, see, well, I mean, the the picture is uh, uh, slightly. Uh, mis see, what what needs to happen is uh, if if let's say one calcium sort of uh, crosslinks, you need the other parts of chain to be flexible enough and free enough to start, uh, you know, the subsequent points to being crosslinked. If you have lots of calcium around, then what happens is you start crosslinking at random points and then the dangling chains are not, uh, you know, lo long enough and flexible enough for you to get the egg box. So it's somewhat counterintuitive that when you have larger amount of calcium, instead of getting more and more egg box, you get only single point crosslinks. Because the single point is basically going and pinching the chain and, and therefore now egg boxes cannot be formed. It's the flex flexibility of the polymer that didn't allow the crosslinks to... Uh, yes, uh, yes. Also, also because there is a lot more calcium. Uh, see, because uh, as soon as one crosslink happens, it is basically constraining the chain, okay. right? And so there are already too many constraint points on the chain for it to now assemble into an egg box. And if you see here, egg box is also not just one chain, uh, I mean two chains. It's a stack of egg boxes actually. So that can happen only with uh, sufficient uh, diffusion of calcium ions and sufficient uh, flexibility of uh, the chains which are present. And uh, this picture sort of is also shown based on X-ray scattering and other uh, experiments. Uh, it also supposedly is uh, how uh, plants uh, modulate the rigidity of uh, so a green uh, mango is very hard, the skin. And as it uh, ripens and becomes yellow or uh, ripening stage, then it becomes softer. And so some of our interest in was also related to the fact that uh, calcium based crosslinking is modulated in plant world to manipulate the, you know, gel uh, stiffness and gel strength and so on. So that was the basic idea behind looking at these kind of systems. So they don't do it necessarily by changing the calcium, they do it by methylating this. So there are enzymes which basically can make uh, CO, CH3 and then it will stop being a cross-linking point. So enzymes which do methylation uh, in the system will then change the overall mechanics of the plant cell wall and thereby changing the rigidity of uh, plant tissues. So uh, the primitive model uh, for uh, uh, such uh, responses is a standard linear solid model uh, which acts basically a uh, strain uh, dependency uh, into the uh, overall uh, uh, variables which are involved and uh, the electrical uh, analog to this is the Zener model, which is basically capacitor, resistor, and an additional uh, 
capacitor. And of course, there are several combinations which can give an equivalent response. And so uh, this, therefore, is a primitive model to use for cross-link systems, uh, as opposed to Maxwell, because the terminal response is a solid-like response, which is what we see in these cross-link systems. And uh, so I think uh, further down, maybe I'll skip some of this, because this is related to another material function called creep. Uh, which is used in certain uh, material systems. Uh, I'll also spend a little bit of uh, uh, time quickly on uh, uh, the fact that uh, if you do measurements with respect to uh, different uh, temperatures, uh, you can form a master curve by uh, you know, uh, using one particular reference temperature. Uh, what's important for us to know is uh, the fact that what you do as a superposition and this master curve forming how much shifting you do uh, you know, corresponds to one of the two theories, depending on what is the mechanisms in the system. So for uh, systems which are more towards glassy systems, uh, you have the WLF, all the vogel fulcher uh, dependence of how much uh, shifting is required for master curve formation. In polymer melts, you have uh, the Arrhenius, uh, so the activated process versus the cooperative uh, processes. And so, uh, Either of these have been uh, used to basically assemble data of uh, linear viscoelasticity over a very wide range of frequencies or time by doing this uh, time temperature superposition. And so uh, in terms of terminology, uh, whenever we see this master curve formation, it's called thermoreologically simple fluid. And the key feature there is uh, basically temperature affects all relaxation modes. Uh, identically. I forgot that I'm online, so maybe I should use the here. So yeah, temperature affects all of the relaxation modes identically. And uh, in the temperature range in which this uh, master curve preparation is being uh, uh, done, uh, there are no transitions that you know fundamentally alter the uh, mechanisms in the material. For example, a crystallization event or, or something would then uh, below and above a temperature, the mechanism relaxation processes would be very different. And so uh, quickly then uh, moving on to uh, the fact that uh, how, how does uh, the overall uh, uh, linear uh, viscoelastic response look like for uh, three representative systems. Uh, if you look at let's say polymer melt, uh, this is in fact a relaxation time spectrum which is over a fairly wide range of uh, uh, frequencies. It basically goes from about 10 to the power minus uh, 4 to all the way to 10 to the power 4. So it's about 8 orders of magnitude and this kind of data is assembled using the time temperature superposition. And what you see is the uh, terminal viscous response at uh, low enough uh, frequencies, but you still really don't get the glassy uh, modes where G double prime starts decreasing and G prime becomes somewhat constant even at uh, high frequencies of 10 to the power 4. You would have to go to a lot more higher frequencies to get uh, you know, uh, the glassy modes being completely dominant. And uh, the uh, other thing is there is effectively one crossover, but it's really uh, uh, to model this kind of a system, you generally tend to have about seven to eight or 10 relaxation modes to describe this kind of, uh, this is polyethylene uh, melt, commercial polyethylene melt kind of data. So it's uh, polydispersed material and uh, therefore you need a lot of relaxation times to describe the behavior. On the other hand, we talked about micellar solution yesterday also. So which uh, over a somewhat uh, narrow frequency range uh, can, you know, go from a, uh, viscous to a glassy uh, kind of a response. The uh, only additional thing which is related to the breakage uh, of uh, the micellar systems is the G double prime minimum, which is not there in the Maxwellian response. And then uh, there are several uh, class of uh, materials which show soft gel response where both G prime and G double prime are largely constant. And uh, if you look at sort of uh, the relaxation time spectrum corresponding to different types of modes. So in case of polymer melts, uh, you have the reptation modes, which are the largest relaxation times. 
and uh, only when uh, the experimental time scale is longer than them, then you see the perfectly viscous dissipative response. And then as you keep on increasing frequency, you have uh, the rubber-like modes, which uh, are uh, highly dissipative as we saw, and uh, subsegmental modes and eventually glassy modes. And for micellar resolution, as we discussed yesterday also, there's a single dominant mode and there is a uh, breaking uh, of the network. And uh, for soft gel solid, though experimentally may not be accessible, if you do carry out uh, work at low enough frequencies, there may be uh, a flow uh, at very low temperature, very low frequencies. And then there are, of course, ne network segment uh, breaking and reforming. So each of these has been, yeah. yeah so uh, I was wondering that uh, for <coughs> the soft gel solid and polymer melts, mm -hmm. microscopically, like what is uh, the fundamental difference? Uh, because the soft gels uh, solid are either assembled out of, uh, let's say, a micro gel kind of a suspension, or it is uh, a supramolecular uh, uh, polymer system. Uh, in which case, uh, the uh, so supramolecular polymer can be assembled by two ways. One is small molecular gelator assembling uh, into uh, fibrils and then a gel. Or you could have polymers also with uh, sticky groups so that you have, uh, you know, uh, temporary or semi-permanent crosslinks. So, so each of these cases, uh, in melt, no such uh, re reptation is basically possible in case of melt. So that reptation is not present here because microgel particles do not have any of that feature. And uh, polymers and supramolecular materials, again, do not have reptation possible. But there can be zipping and unzipping of these uh, sticky points in the system or breaking and reforming of the fi fibrils if it's a smaller molecular weight uh, gelation system. So that's why uh, the... Uh, uh, if at all you observe the flow, uh, it will be a complete disruption of the whatever assembly that's there in the system. And so one can uh, look at all of this using, uh, you know, spectrum of relaxation time. And uh, sort of this slide, uh, you know, just summarizes in a very uh, broad manner all the mechanisms which, uh, you know, are responsible for all of these relaxation modes. Uh, each of them sub, uh, also, of course, uh, is built in theoretically depending on, you know, what is the system present. Uh, but uh, for the macromolecular system, you have the chain level information itself, which accounts for, you know, rotation vibra vibration of the bonds, the stretching of the bonds, bond, you know, bending torsion. And then the molecular interactions, uh, which could be repulsive or attractive, uh, and then there are several uh, different classes in which we look at these, whether it's excluded volume, which is repulsion, or, uh, you know, polar interactions, hydrophobic interactions. And, and so this is, in case of polymers, this is valid for both inter and intra-chain interactions. So even for very dilute polymer system, you have to consider these when you are trying to look at uh, rheology of those systems. And at, with higher concentration, entanglement is a major... Uh, descriptor. Uh, the molecular architecture in terms of linear or branched makes a big difference. And so there has been a lot of work related to, you know, uh, star-like polymers. You know, so this, this has a very different molecular architecture compared to uh, a linear polymer or a branched polymer. So molecular architecture also plays a very significant role in terms of what would be the relaxation modes that are present in the system. And uh, of course, then uh, if it's a solution system, then interactions with solvents. And similarly, for the uh, particulate or uh, multiphase systems, you have the interparticle interactions. Uh, again, uh, large variations of those. And at high volume fractions, you have uh, lubrication and friction contact based uh, interactions also present. And so, uh, our endeavor in rheology is always to try to, you know, take recourse to one or more of these and then try to explain the observations that we have. And uh, this is just to uh, sort of again highlight uh, the issues associated with entanglement and reptation and uh, how it gets represented in a uh, polymeric melt system. So this is uh, data basically from books uh, for uh, decades. And uh, this I have already talked about that this is a commercial polyethylene 
And uh, you can see this is 10 to the power minus 3 to 10 to the power 4. And uh, we see basically viscous response to, uh, you know, response which is elastic dominated. And uh, on the, this side is monodispersed polymer. And since it's a commercial one, it's basically a polydispersed polymer. And these are different molecular weights. So increasing molecular weights. And so what you see is uh, the terminal viscous response is there where G prime uh, is proportional to omega squared. But as you start increasing the molecular weight, the entanglement becomes more and more prominent and you have this uh, rubbery plateau in a polymer melt. This rubbery plateau is absent in a commercial system because you have polydispersed. Uh, uh, the molecule length is very different. So there are always smaller fragments and larger chains. They are all together. So individually, you might have this rubbery plateau, but since each of them is occurring at different places, the summation of all of those gives you this basically an overall uh, gradual increase. And so the reptation modes are not as prevalent uh, in case of the polydispersed systems because of this. So fairly systematic work has been done to you know, also estimate what is this G prime value and how does this relate to the mesh size and so on for variety of polymeric systems. And uh, this can get modified if you attach some sticky groups. Right, so, so that uh, these sticky groups are unlike entanglements where slippage is possible, these have uh, lifetimes which are longer than what entanglements allows. And so that changes uh, the rheology quite significantly. And so like yes, so, but, but they're not permanent crosslinks. So, so therefore there is a, uh, there, it's a possibility that uh, you know, you can uh, extend the overall low frequency response to you know, flow-like systems, yeah, yeah, completely. And uh, yeah, maybe, uh, so, so, and uh, the polymers, uh, the uh, other advantages, there's very systematic theories to try to explain the departure from uh, what's observed for sticky polymers. And uh, so uh, basically, uh, this would be the uh, viscous response, but then you start getting, uh, uh, you know, because of the sticky groups being present, you start seeing G prime and G double prime much larger than what would be for viscous systems. But the rubber-like uh, plateau is still present. And then of course, going on to, uh, so all of this can be explained using theoretical models. So I'll, I'll skip some of this. I'll come back to it uh, later if, uh, during LAOS discussions. And so one last thing that I wanted to look uh, within this uh, linear viscoelastic uh, system is related to the transition of a uh, gel point where uh, a system spanning uh, uh, network is formed or percolation happens. And you can look at it from a viscosity increasing or uh, the increase in uh, G prime uh, given a point where, uh, you know, G prime starts dominating compared to the G double prime. Uh, at the same time, uh, if you look at it uh, from the point of view of self-similarity of the network at the critical gel point, uh, we have basically uh, that both G prime and G double prime vary uh, in power law fashion at the gel point itself, given the self-similar network that is formed. And so given that both of them have the same scaling, the ratio G double prime by G prime, which is this tan delta, becomes independent of frequency. Because if you look at G prime and G double prime, both of these are functions of frequency. So gel point, as you measure in terms of crossover between G prime and G double prime will change. But the percolation happens at a particular point. And so that can be determined rheologically using what's called this winter chamber criteria, where you would plot tan delta as a function of time. And time at which uh, the tan delta is uh, basically independent of frequency, this, all these runs are at different frequencies. And so uh, this is used uh, many times to try to measure uh, the gel points and looking at uh, what is the, uh, even this uh, power, uh, the, given that when you form the self-similar uh, gel, 
the relaxation modulus is no longer an exponential but a power law in time also. So in uh, at the critical gel point uh, g of t is also t to the power uh, minus n. So it is a power law dependence as opposed to an exponential as uh, predicted by Maxwell. And so one can look at uh, the type of uh, fractal nature of the gel and all of that doing this uh, analysis. And so uh, I will skip this. Uh, some work that we did earlier which is uh, a, a somewhat different system. So this is a microcrystalline cellulose. Cellulose is not soluble in water but it is soluble in uh, this ionic liquid. And uh, so you can form solutions of cellulose and ionic liquid and uh, when you start adding water, water is basically a non-solvent, co-non-solvent. So as soon as you start adding water, you start uh, forming assemblies of cellulose and therefore you start getting different types of phases. And the depending on the assembly of the cellulose, you actually see uh, fairly uh, different types of phases based on our microscopic observations. So this is uh, the amount of water that is being added into uh, a solution of crystalline cellulose and the uh, ionic liquid. So as you go, as you increase uh, water, you basically at 15 percent if you focus, you go from an isotropic phase to some, uh, you know, transition zone where there are some anisotropic domains to basically a gel-like system. And so we were also looking at uh, rheological signatures of these. So if you change water at 15 percent, what happens, right? So you are basically undergoing a transition between a solution-like system uh, at uh, low water content to a gel-like system. So you basically again have a salt to gel transition in this system. And uh, if you uh, assemble the tan delta versus percent water in this system, what you see is basically again, uh, you know, some particular uh, water content at which you see sort of a gelation that is observed. And so you can uh, uh, look at this transition going from uh, solution to a gelation uh, in these systems. So I think that is about it uh, I had in terms of uh, linear viscoelastic response. Uh, are there any questions? Yeah. So uh, as the gelation happens, as hmm. I understand it, so there are like uh, these constituent, uh, so they uh, self-assemble, yeah. but it is a process which takes time. So one one will, uh, I mean, it, the gelation will start at many points. And right, then, right, yeah. And yeah. Will, so what so in, in this case, you uh, sort of wait for the gel to form and then only look at it. So you are not looking at kinetics of uh, gel formation, you are looking at uh, the state of the system at different water contents. Yeah. In its uh, arrested final state. Okay. In the pre in the previous slides, where you ah. have G prime G double prime, uh, where G prime crosses G double prime. Ah, in this this yeah. case, yeah. So, so this case, you are looking at the kinetics and therefore transitioning uh, in a system as a function of time. Yeah. Okay. So that this point where the G prime crosses G double prime, this point is the point where the whole system, the network spans the whole system, or is it? Yeah, yeah. Effectively, but. Uh, what happens is both G prime and G double prime are uh, dependent on the frequency, right? Okay. So this is in the neighborhood of the critical point, uh, which is the gel point, but we don't know whether this time exactly is the gel time, okay. right? Because it's a frequency dependent measure, while critical uh, gelation as a critical point is not dependent on frequency. time at which, you know, when the self-similar network is formed, you basically Okay. is the gel point. Given that you are doing a mechanical perturbation, uh, the observation of this crossover depends on the time scale of your perturbation. Okay. Thank you. Any other uh, question? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. So I had a, like maybe slightly <laughs> off track. Yeah. Uh, this uh, you spoke about this uh, relaxation in polymer melts and all. Right. So in the male state, uh, like there is no solvent basically. Yeah, right? yeah. So then like, uh, I mean, uh, between two chains, like is it just 
some empty <coughs> space or like what kind of? Yeah, yeah. It's just a molecular system huh. with a vacuum uh, between uh, polymer. Uh, yes. So it's effectively a liquid system, but okay. the uh, uh, monomers are attached together with covalent bonds. Mm -hmm. So, the conformational landscape of monomers is restricted by the fact that its two neighbors are fixed, okay. neighbors on both sides. Mm -hmm. So, okay. but in, uh, but Brownian motion yes. of the chains. Yeah, yeah. So, between, uh, so that's why this, uh, this kind of a behavior mm -hmm. is an indicator of uh, the fact that uh, in some time scales, sure. the two entanglement points are acting as if they are crosslink cross points. Link which have, uh, you know, uh, uh, at this time scale, they appear to be permanent. Yes. So, uh, beyond this, uh, it's the subsegmental modes are relevant and therefore entanglement points are not relevant. Right. And at much lower uh, times, uh, at much higher time scales or lower frequency, right. the chain can rotate out. Okay. Thanks. But uh, uh, you can see this only with a monodispersed yes. polymer. With a polydispersed polymer, given the chain lengths and their entanglements, you get a basically you smoothening get, out yeah, of the mixed up. Yeah, so. all mixed up. Yeah. But one could talk about presumably at least the largest uh, relaxation time from this, right? So beyond which you see the uh, terminal viscous response, it can give you some idea of, uh, you know, the largest relaxation time present in the system. But does it go to uh, that ma Maxwell? That ma yes, yes, perfectly. So this, okay. this would be uh, uh, two, two, yeah, two and one. On the other hand, this w is still not uh, glassy. Uh, so, uh, I mean, you don't really see G double prime going down and this really becoming a constant. So, that you would have to presumably go to, because we, we are talking, let's say, if it's polyethylene, this could be at 130, 140 degrees Celsius, the temperature at which uh, this is done. Actually, it's uh, here, right? So, it's uh, 100 and uh, 100, this, some data is at 100 and something and it's going little even beyond yeah, to 170, 180 well, degrees yeah. Celsius. Okay, I'll just uh, so I'll talk uh, some. Uh, features uh, related to yield stress and thixotropy and a uh, lot of uh, work already is going on in this. Uh, so, a uh, lot of I, what I would say probably is uh, familiar. So, I probably will uh, skip through some of the details uh, as we go along. So, the idea is uh, to look at uh, yield stress and uh, thixotropy both and uh, look at some aspects of uh, uh, the behavior uh, what corresponds to the microstructural changes that happen in these systems. And uh, so again, we are looking at uh, yield stress, uh, thixotropic kind of systems. And uh, generally to look at these, uh, we might, uh, you know, look at uh, viscosity, we might uh, look at uh, change in viscosity with transients. So these are some uh, uh, parameters which we look at to examine these. And one primitive model is uh, herschel berkeley model. And uh, generally, uh, one uh, would need to sort of, uh, you know, is there really a cyclic steady state or steady state that is observed? Because many of these systems are time dependent. There is aging. There is structural rearrangements. Uh, you know, how much uh, any, any experiment that we do, how much is history still involved? you know, how much times are involved. Uh, so, as opposed to viscoelasticity, where uh, the relaxation processes are uh, determining the time scale, here the structural rearrangements are also one of the key factor. So, how much time is it required? And, and when, if we, when we stop the shearing, do we reach an arrested state or, uh, you know, it can reach equilibrium? Many of the polymer mills or the other systems that we talked about, there is a definite state at rest, which also happens to be an equilibrium state. 
But in these cases, uh, there may not be an equilibrium state. So what's our reference point? Uh, and uh, you know, so the state that you get, uh, if it depends on the type of shearing, then you know what what do we mean by you know the state at rest and so on. So there are these kind of questions that are still uh, difficult to sort of uh, uh, talk about very crisply in many of these systems. Uh, general uh, sort of uh, uh, idea is that there are uh, interactions between particles, and uh, if those are uh, somewhat uh, fixed. Uh, then we have a more elastic uh, material or a rigid material depending on you know how much deformation we impose on the system. If those are weak, uh, then uh, the particles can then uh, move freely and therefore uh, we end up getting a fluid-like system. So uh, is it uh, possible with shearing to you know break these? And uh, if at all, what is the value of uh, stress or strain at which this kind of breakage can happen, right? These are the questions that uh, one needs to look at. And uh, you could have uh, basically the assemblies where uh, you have uh, clusters and cages uh, which sort of define the overall immobility uh, of these uh, particles. And therefore, then one would talk about breaking of these cages if at all yielding and post yielding is defined. Uh, you could also have uh, basically a sample spanning network of particles, then in which case disruption in that network is what will lead to yielding. So depending on the system that's present, you could have uh, either of these where in the solid state or elastic or rigid state, you have these cage particles or a sp sample spanning network. And then uh, once it's fluid like, it's basically a disrupted network or an uncaged. And so you have breaking of the bonds and cages and that's what sort of uh, presumably we observe as an yielding phenomena in a rheological experiment. And so traditionally, uh, basically what we say is below a certain value of stress, material either does not deform or has infinite viscosity and uh, it's basically a rigid or even if it's uh, elastic, it's elastic with a very, very high modulus. And then above this value of stress, uh, it deforms very easily. Uh, it has low viscosity and uh, basically is fluid. Uh, in terms of metal plasticity and uh, the yield that we talk about, there are uh, some differences in terms of what uh, is the underlying mechanisms of dissipation once the post yielding happens. And uh, also the description in terms of measurement of yield point varies greatly for many of these fluid-like systems. And uh, so one way of doing the yield stress measurement is uh, basically you apply constant strain rate on the material and uh, you measure the stress at different strain rates. So again, it's a steady measurement, steady viscosity measurement. And then uh, you look at uh, the variation of stress as a function of gamma dot theta phi and there is a finite stress as strain rate tends to zero. And uh, sort of uh, in uh, textbooks, this is what uh, we would learn for a Bingham uh, plastic kind of a uh, material, where uh, as uh, gamma dot uh, tends to zero, you have a finite uh, stress, which is we call the yield stress, which is the yield stress. And so the uh, Herschel-Berkeley model is uh, the yield stress plus shear thinning. And so many times uh, what people would do is measure viscosity as a function of strain rate and we cannot really go to low enough strain rates to actually observe the yield stress very effectively. So you do then a curve fitting with this Herschel-Berkeley model and then read out basically the yield stress from the experimental data. And so uh, if you look at uh, yielding in general for many of the different systems, uh, there are different ways in which uh, we can measure the yield stress. Uh, you can do it in steady shear or oscillatory shear or a creep measurement. And by looking at uh, the variations, what I explained just now is just looking at stress versus strain rate or viscosity versus strain rate. But you could look at many of these data in different manner and then try to arrive at a value of yield stress. And I'll, I'll show this for a set of food 
uh, items that uh, recently was uh, sort of talked about. Uh, using oscillatory shear, uh, you can see that there are various measures that you could use to talk about what may be the quote unquote yielding point in this particular system. And so the first one you can see is where the transition from the linear to nonlinear uh, response is. Uh, the second one is uh, associated with uh, in G double prime itself where the limit is or it also is associated with uh, a small overshoot which says there is a maximum in dissipation. And therefore that point uh, is taken as the second point. You could also have, uh, you plot the same uh, data as strain amplitude, instead of plotting it uh, as G prime or G double prime, you plot as G prime times gamma naught, the stress itself. So the stress amplitude, so to speak, and then wherever uh, there is a departure from the linear uh, you know, response. And that uh, leads to another uh, measure of what's the critical strain at which yielding is observed. And then you can draw asymptotes and based on the intersection of asymptotes you can look at. So there is an asymptote which is related to constant and then there is an asymptote which is related to the fluid like response, the two. So, so, so what this paper sort of tries to highlight is all these different measures and you know what, how do they relate to each other. For example, this is a table from the same paper and they did it for a couple of food, food items. And uh, you can see that uh, the stress estimated this way is, you know, varying uh, quite a bit. And, and the one which I talked about where you just take stress versus strain rate and do a herschel berkeley fit, uh, that value is also sort of there. So uh, there is, uh, as far as yielding is concerned and, and its, uh, you know, significance related to microscopic mechanisms is, is still a uh, uh, lot to be sort of understood. And in terms of exact quantification, of what do we mean uh, by yield stress? And uh, what does it correspond to physically in terms of uh, what we are trying to look at in our system? And so we will uh, now uh, transition to the thixotropic uh, materials uh, where uh, time dependency comes in through evolving structure. And uh, there is a big uh, sort of uh, difference in terms of the rebuilding time scales being also very significant. And uh, so the relaxation process, if you look at, uh, basically what we are saying is the relaxation processes keep on changing in the system. So if you look at it from the point of view of a Maxwell model, what we are uh, saying is there is a relaxation process and uh, this relaxation process is basically diff based on the underlying mechanism. But if we say that this, look, this uh, lambda is a function of some uh, structural parameter in the system. So given that there is rebuilding happening, given that there is breakage happening, now the relaxation time in the system keeps on changing as a function of this structure in the system. And there is another evolution for this structure. So there is a, not just a relaxation time scales, which are viscoelastic time scales, now you have time scales associated with thixotropy in the system. And now it's interplay of both of these that will determine the overall rheological signatures in the material. So therefore evolving structure uh, is related to the evolution of relaxation time. So when we look at these thixotropic uh, materials and uh, description of their rheological response, what you would see is we will have a model which is like a Maxwell model or a Herschel Berkeley or any of these. And then the parameters of those models are dependent on the structure. And so it's both evolutions we look at simultaneously to explain the overall stress strain response of these systems. Any questions uh, on this? Yeah. So this uh, evolution, is it uh, under shear or just uh, uh, like? Ha, no, so it, it is, uh, so the one key feature is that uh, this is a function of uh, uh, the uh, rate constants of uh, rebuilding and uh, uh, reformation, but it's also a function of uh, the shearing of the system, deformation. So that influences and uh, you could have, uh, presumably it's easy for us to sort of justify 
that breakage is affected by the shear rate, but you could also have reformation affected by shear rate. Of course, you would have a Brownian term which uh, leads to reformation, but you can have a shearing induced reformation also. So the rate constants of this evolution equation can be, uh, you know, related to the sort of uh, uh, the, uh, the rate terms in this equation can be related to the shear rate. Yeah. And uh, historically, the way uh, sort of thixotropic materials have been looked at are for viscous fluid-like systems. And so generally, the description is based on strain rate. And the structure in the material depends on strain rate and not really the amount of deformation that has been accumulated in the system. So most of the evolution equation and the thixotropic models that you see and the materials which are studied under this thixotropy, the assumption is that it's a fluid-like system where strain rate determines the microstructure and therefore the relaxation processes in the system. So this, uh, you would not see that SP is a function of uh, the accumulated strain in the system. That, that's not really observed at all in most of the thixotropic system that are studied. Yeah, you had a question? Yeah, maybe just, yeah. No, I was a little confused about that. You told that uh, depends upon strain rate. Huh. Without the shear also, material can edge. And it, the thixotropy yes. material should depend upon the time only. And the rate should deform the structure. Uh, yielding might happen under shear rate. Right. But the thixotropy property should depend upon the time itself only. Right. So, no, so that's why so when we talk about aging and aging materials, the, uh, the presumption there is that the structural uh, SP, the, what I have written as a, you know, either a scalar or a, a vectorial, maybe some description of structure, that uh, depends on time. And under quiescent conditions also, aging happens. While in thixotropy, the assumption is uh, that you are looking at those material systems where the shearing the system is influencing the microstructure. So that's the small difference between aging and the thixotropic uh, systems. So the but, but if I consider a parameter, let's viscosity, huh. and uh, under shear, let's say viscosity at constant uh, shear rate you are applying, right? And in one case, your viscosity increases. Huh. And the other case, let's say, hypothetical viscosity decreases. Okay. I can understand the yielding behavior. Right. But how could you understand the uh, increase in viscosity at constant shear rate, let's say? Uh -huh. Because that is also considered as the thixotropic uh, material. Huh. So, uh, so as, as I was mentioning, the shearing, right? So, for a, uh, shearing could induce, uh, let's say, hydrodynamic clustering, right? Which then will lead to larger crystals when you start shearing and therefore a viscosity increase. So if that's your question as to you can understand viscosity decrease due to shearing because yielding and viscosity decrease is leading to due to material uh, disruption of the structure. So you could lead to formation of the structure due to shearing, right? So hydrodynamic clustering is one such mechanism where you sort of lead to larger cluster sizes with higher shear rates. Or in case of anisotropic systems, you can have interlocking at higher shear rates. You don't give enough time for the interlocked, uh, you know, anisotropic uh, sort of rod-like systems to, uh, you know, align and things like that. So shear thickening, let's say, which is at higher and higher shear rate is observed when you uh, start shearing the system and therefore you obtain larger clusters with shearing. No, that is where the confusion is. Mm. In one case, you increase the shear rate and you observe right, the some yeah, behavior. Yeah. This is with respect to time. Ta yeah. But this is at constant shear rate, but yeah. with respect, with respect to, time. to time. Yeah. So what I'm saying is just the way you see that when you uh, start shearing the system, <laughs> right? By the way, 90, 95 percent, some very high number of materials do decrease in viscosity at constant shear rate. There are very small classes of materials where the opposite is observed, where the viscosity increases at a constant uh, strain rate with respect to time. And there the mechanisms such as clustering due to shearing would start happening. But it's a very small class of materials. So uh, as I, uh, so a, a, primit uh, a very uh, simple model which could be written down for evolution of structure 
is basically, uh, you know, uh, if uh, we generally say that, you know, SP as 1 corresponds to, you know, formed structure and uh, SP going to 0 is basically broken down structure. And so you have uh, the formation and breakage and uh, if, if let's say if it's all uh, uh, SP is 0, then this term will dominate and if uh, SP is 1, then this term will dominate because SP is 1 implies that it's completely formed structure, so shearing will then start breaking more and more. So you have a rate equation, this is a very simple rate equation that I've written, but this rate equation needs to be clubbed with overall stress strain response of the material so that uh, you can then start describing the overall rheological response of the material system. And uh, just to illustrate this uh, with a, a simple uh, sort of a uh, 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 Maxwell model uh, for stress growth, right? Uh, stress growth implies you apply a constant strain rate and look at stress as a function of time. And uh, for Maxwell model, it's an exponential increase. So at a constant strain rate, tau yx as a function of time is basically a increase in viscosity. Because you are applying a constant strain rate, it's a first order ODE, so you will get an exponential function. So stress increases linearly with time for a viscoelastic uh, material. You can define a viscosity which is called the stress growth viscosity which is tau yx divided by gamma dot yx and this is a function of time. So eta plus itself is also a function of time. So this is called a stress growth viscosity. Now uh, what you could do is uh, uh, this stress growth viscosity you can combine with a structural parameter, right? So you say now you are looking at a thixotropic system where due to the influence of shearing you have the evolution of structure in the material and now if you put these two toy models together what you will see is a structure parameter SP going from a high value to a low value at the steady state and the viscosity will increase and then decrease. And this is due to that uh, you know breakup of the structure and eventually giving you an increase and decrease in viscosity. So this is how the thixotropic response is a combination of the underlying viscoelastic response plus the microstructural evolution that's taking place in the material. And uh, this uh, review uh, talks about mainly yield stress uh, material, but the example that's given here in terms of these carbopol and uh, bentonite systems, stress versus shear rate, if you look at, there is a forward loop and going back. And you can see the two systems are very different. Uh, you have an yield stress, but when you go forward and come back, the, they exactly trace the same point. And so therefore, the evolution of structure is not a significant phenomena here. This is just an yield stress system. So the breakage reformation time scales and evolution of structure, especially the rebuilding time scales are quite uh, fast. And so, you basically come back the same way because this is one important way of uh, sort of looking at thixotropic system. You say that I'll measure stress as a function of uh, strain rate and uh, what you see is if I measure three data points like this and uh, if I consider, uh, you know, this particular data point, if I am going forward, then what has happened is I have first reached a steady state at lower strain rate which means the structure, structure is more built. And now I have come to a higher shear rate, so I am going to lead to little bit more of breakage. On the other hand, if I am at this point and then come down, then what happens is the structure is already broken and it has to rebuild when it comes to the lower strain rate. And so you would generally tend to observe a hysteresis when you do this uh, uh, sort of a steady shear kind of a measurement. And so this kind of a loop is what you see for a more predominantly thixotropic uh, kind of a system. So which is this uh, bentonite uh, systems that is sort of talked about in this uh, review article. Yeah, so uh, just a uh, uh, follow up because yeah. there the structure build up is very fast. Yeah, uh, yeah. So it immediately, so right. the equivalent thing is like suppose now if I apply a constant shear rate uh -huh. to the system, Right. The, that material will immediately reach a steady, steady state, state. Yeah, whereas yeah. this one uh, will, yeah, will like uh, depending on right. the… Right, and they may increase and decrease increase and those and kind decrease. of features you will see in these. Uh, okay. yeah. 
So therefore, this gives us to the next point that while looking at these thixotropic system, one should, one should look at the transition from one steady state to the other as opposed to looking at picture in this form. And so, uh, I'll uh, skip through some of these introductory things and uh, talk about this. So a lot of uh, rheological work that we've been doing for these thixotropic systems are related to basically looking at transition between one strain rate and the other and look at what's happening to the, uh, you know, stress in the system as we look at. So this is a step up experiment where you are at a constant strain rate at a time t is equal to zero. You just suddenly increase the strain rate on the system. And uh, if you look at sort of Newtonian fluid, the expectation would be that the stress also will just do a step change because strain rate is step change. Uh, for a solid, you have an increase in stress because strain rate is constant. So strain is accumulating. So stress also will have to accumulate. And then since stress is, strain rate is higher, the stress will start accumulating at a higher rate uh, when this step change happens. So this is what you would see for uh, you know, ideal fluid and solid systems. For a viscoelastic system, what you see is a sort of uh, increase, a gradual increase, uh, because you are now leading to a higher strain rate. So material has to transition to a higher stress value, but it will undergo that at uh, certain finite time scales based on the relaxation processes in the system. But for a perfectly thixotropic system, because you are going to a step change, you will immediately have a jump in stress. But then the structure starts breaking down because now you are shearing the system at a higher strain rate. So therefore, there will be a decrease in viscosity. So the viscoelastic response leads to an increase in stress or viscosity while the stress decreases for a thixotropic system. And this is what we saw when we did a startup experiment. We saw an increase and decrease in stress signature. Right? So that the, that step up that we did was from zero to some finite value. But you can do the same thing between two steady state uh, values. And similarly, you can do a step down experiment. And again, what you see is uh, there is a decrease for viscoelastic system and there is an increase for a perfectly thixotropic system. And so now when you look at the experimental data, this is uh, work done by Ramya in our lab, uh, where uh, you can sort of look at step down, step up. This is basically step down. So you shear the system at five per second, and then you transition to one of these strain rates. Right? And then you look at what happens to stress. And you can see that there is a decrease, which is due to the viscoelastic uh, uh, contributions. And then there is an increase, which is because of the structural buildup. The system was sheared at a higher shear rate, and then it has been brought down to a lower shear rate. And when the step is larger, right, this is 0 0.05, you can see that the buildup is much more. Because at 0 0.05, the structure will be a lot less disturbed at a steady state, so there is a lot more building to happen. And uh, of course, depending on the time scale of measurement that we can see, uh, you can see that uh, some of those events are not really apparent when you are doing step change, which is far more a gradual step change. And so uh, one of the things that we've been doing in the lab is also to try to model uh, some of these phenomena. And so I think we are reaching 12 now. So uh, maybe what I'll do is I'll quickly go through this and talk about the modeling aspect of this uh, in the afternoon uh, lecture. So uh, we also were looking at these thixotropic systems in oscillatory shear as to what can we sort of understand if we do oscillatory shear on the system where the enforcing term now is a strain amplitude. And largely, you see this uh, gel-like response uh, over these uh, you know, four orders of magnitude. You have G prime, which is relatively constant, and G double prime also relatively constant with some change for the same uh, fumed silica. Uh, you know, so this is fumed silica. There is a polymer, and then there is an oil. So it's a suspension of these. And uh, presumably, because of the hydrophilic uh, patches on fumed silica, there is agglomeration possible. And these polyisobutylene also will aid in those bridging of those uh, particles. So that's why the, at, at 2 volume percent, 3 volume percent, you get 
these clusters which are basically the structure which is formed and when you start shearing the clusters start breaking and that is the transition that you are seeing in these fume silica systems. And so, uh, we were uh, looking at you know how do we analyze this uh, small amplitude uh, data given that the what is linearity in this system uh, you know uh, given that there is a time dependency and evolutionary nature of these materials uh, you know we basically uh, try to do analysis using Kramer chronic to try to analyze uh, what how does this oscillatory data look like. And uh, when you calculate the residuals uh, based on this uh, KK theory what we saw is for thixotropic systems you see very significant residuals and so which uh, again is an along expected lines given that these are heavily time dependent systems uh, when you look at these measurements of G prime and G double prime they are not really linear uh, systems and so the residuals that we see are 20 percent uh, fairly significant and uh, depending on the strain again the residuals can change and uh, if you do this on some standard fluid like this is viscosity standard Newtonian fluid then you observe the viscous response and absolutely no residuals. So basically consistent data but as soon as you start so this is fumed silica and paraffin oil but without the polymer which leads to more effective bridging but even this system is thixotropic and immediately again you see uh, residuals to be quite significant in case of oscillatory shear. And uh, if you just use the polymer itself right then it is a largely viscous system but also a very noisy system. And so what you see is uh, at uh, low frequencies you can make the noise out by just looking KK residuals and so you know not to rely on that data. Of course you can see it in the frequency domain result itself you do not really need the KK theory to confirm it but uh, this is something we sort of just looked at. Uh, to confirm some of the results that we are obtaining. So with this I will stop here and then uh, we will look at uh, the thixotropic modeling uh, briefly in the afternoon's lecture. So, uh, Any we, questions? Uh, we have uh, half an hour. Okay. Uh, so we can continue? I mean we can, uh, 12.30. Oh, it is 12.30 right? Uh, okay, okay. Yeah, then I will continue now. Yeah, yeah not 12. Yeah, yeah, we can pause and then I will just finish that lecture. Yeah, yeah. You can take a pause also. <laughs> yeah, I, that is a good idea. I, I completely forgot that it is up to 12.30. Yeah, sure. Yeah, so that is a sort of a, a very difficult uh, question to answer. Uh, and so far uh, at least within the uh, uh, you know purview of the model systems that we have see so uh, uh, blood for example is also known to show thixotropic uh, behavior and there it is the assembly of red blood cells okay. and uh, but, but either in case of blood or these kind of fume silica model systems there really have not been measurements to talk about and uh, the next system that I am going to talk about our uh, uh, one of the uh, sort of motivation to start with that system was to you know be able to characterize the structure but we have not yet done it. So there what we are instead of using this oil we are using a low molecular weight polyethylene melt so that you can freeze it and then presumably take it to microscope and then you know try to quantify the structure yeah. but uh, it has not been done yet yeah so therefore there is it is just a hypothetical additional parameter. Uh, which is being used to try to explain the data. Oh. Uh, can I ask? Yeah, yeah, yeah sure. So this, uh, uh, when you are talking about this residual, so uh. this, uh, I miss that uh, this Kramer's chronic part. Uh. So you are, uh, uh, so this based on this linear response, right. like you. Feed yeah. the data and then take the difference with the experiment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That is the right. Response. Or you use one. Uh, I mean, you use let's say one uh, uh, the x prime uh, as the basis, hmm. and then try to estimate what is the uh, should be according to linear response. What's the and then look at the residual. Right. And so uh, the, the the algorithm, of course, involves certain uh, details in terms of how do you evaluate this integral given that it's 
0 to infinity and things like that. Some technical details are there, but I think there are standard sort of uh, tools available to try to do this exercise. So I'll just make few remarks also about uh, uh, 3D printing because uh, if you look at 3D printing literature, they say that thixotropic ink is des desirable because then uh, while you are printing, it's broken down structure. As soon as it comes on the bed, it forms, right? So I need a thixotropic material. So I was scanning the literature for uh, this, uh, uh, this presentation I made earlier in a conference, which I am now making here. So I was just trying to see what do those 3D printing people do in terms of characterizing thixotropy. So I'll, I'll just make some remarks regarding that also. Yeah, so uh, what I need to. Since this is now created using a different tool, the zoom and other things are all So uh, basically the model systems that we are looking at here is uh, looking at, uh, you know, fume silica in a polymer melt. Uh, and uh, presumably this also can, uh, you know, affect the breakup and building process because now the medium viscosity is very different compared to a polymer solution with paraffin oil. So that was uh, our, uh, and, and then we are trying to model this to try to see if we can extract some rate constants and look at uh, some of them in this process. And as I said, uh, uh, given that there is a requirement of structured fluids in this 3D printing literature, what do they mean when they are saying that we are using thixotropic inks? And what do they, how do they quantify the nature of thixotropy that's present in the system? And so this we've already spoken about, that uh, we sort of increase and decrease, and there is a hysteresis uh, when we observe thixotropy. And uh, presumably it's because of, you know, uh, formed structure to break up. And then when you do a step change, it leads to a partial recovery of the structure. And uh, this is what, uh, in this particular uh, presentation, now lambda is the structural parameter, uh, which I preferred to as earlier as SP. And uh, this is a more realistic uh, evolution equation, which is uh, used uh, to describe uh, how the structural evolution might happen. And uh, of course, it, uh, all the coefficients are right now arbitrary, but uh, for easy, uh, you know, rather than treating all of them as fitting parameters, we tend to use, you know, first order processes. So the exponents, uh, you know, M and N, uh, more often than not, we take them as uh, simple first order processes. Uh, so that M equal to one and N equal to one. But presumably this is a more uh, sort of a generic equation. Uh, one is directly related to the breakdown because uh, shearing is involved. And uh, the other is uh, reformation because of uh, shear. Uh, because again, the rate constant depends on the shear rate. And the third is uh, related to the formation under uh, uh, Brownian motion. And uh, the reformation are of course depends on uh, how much you are far away from one, uh, lambda being one, being perfectly formed structure. And so uh, the two systems that uh, we compared is this traditional system uh, with which uh, several groups have worked on over the last 10, 15 years which is the fumed silica in uh, paraffin oil and polyisobutylene. And then the one which we are looking at is uh, low density polyethylene. And all our experiments are done at 110 degrees Celsius, where the, yeah. No, again I come in. So yeah. you know, I just wanted to say that this equation can also be. Yeah. 
this equation can also be used for falling ball viscometry. Right, right. Right, and I mean, I think it has been successfully used by many people without the last term. Last term, okay. Yeah. Okay. Because it has both uh, structure induced, I mean, shear induced formation and breakage. Yeah. Right. So, I mean, falling ball, of course, to a non human. Non, yeah, yeah, yeah. So th this would be more a, like a phenomenological description of the structure formation and breakage in that kind of a system, yeah. Which is what we are also doing under rheometric uh, conditions. And so uh, the, the preparation uh, for the two is uh, uh, slightly different because one involves a polymer melt. And so uh, we use uh, something called a plastic order which is more like a, a mixer. For example, if we have to mix dough, right, uh, chapati or bread dough. Uh, then we need very different kinds of uh, impellers and this is sigma blades and uh, so this is an instrument which is used for polymer mixing and distributing of particulate matter in polymer melts. And the other is of course a bench top uh, stirring uh, kind of a preparation. And so if you look at uh, the uh, steady state response, uh, both of them have yield stress and both of them show shear thinning. So you have an yield stress uh, higher for the polyethylene system and uh, uh, lower uh, shear st uh, yield stress for the uh, poly, uh, paraffin oil and PIB system. But both of them have uh, this uh, shear thinning uh, response as you go to higher and higher strain, strain rate. And presumably this is where you would have formed structure and uh, at higher shear rates you would have uh, more or less broken down structure. So if you look at from the point of view of thixotropy, uh, you know, presumably these are the strain rate ranges where uh, breaking reformation processes would happen simultaneously and explanation of those and these strain rates would be of uh, sort of greater interest. So going from one strain rate and this to the other or coming down from one strain rate to the other is what we would be sort of interested in characterizing. And which is what we saw, uh, where you can do a step up or a step down shear. And uh, in case of a viscoelastic uh, material, we saw that there is a monotonic increase or decrease. Uh, but in case of a, a thixotropic material, you have a, a basically build up or a breakdown of the system, uh, which leads to a change in uh, stresses. And uh, so this is a comparison between the uh, paraffin oil on the one hand and polyethylene on the other. Okay, so uh, these are again uh, step up experiments. So you are uh, going to these particular uh, strain rates from a strain rate of 0.1. So 0.1 is where steady state is reached and then you transition to a higher shear rate. And in case of polyethylene, you can clearly see the increase and then a decrease. Because you are going to a higher strain rate, there is a pronounced breakdown of the structure and that decrease you can see. And uh, the increase is not as evident uh, in case of the paraffin oil uh, system. But so therefore by changing the medium in this fume silica, we are modulating the breaking and reforming time scales. Uh, paraffin oil and polyethylene melts are molecularly similar systems, CH2, CH2, CH2. So therefore, uh, the assumption is that at least uh, the background uh, medium uh, from a point of view of physical chemical interactions is not very different. And uh, if you sort of uh, plot the same data for uh, step up and step down in a normalized variation, so that uh, rather than looking, because each of these, if you see, reaches a different maximum and so on. So we just uh, normalize this uh, data and then uh, looked at the variation. So basically in case of uh, uh, step up, you have an increase and then decrease, uh, or in the other case, you have a decrease and then an increase. And so what are the time scales uh, involved in these uh, processes? And uh, if you look at uh, the breakage time scales, you can see that there is a significant difference. So what I have highlighted is, is a sort of same uh, 0.5 per second this is polyethylene, right? So you can see there is a half an order of increase in the time scale associated with when it reaches, let's say, uh, you know, exponential, uh, basically that 37%. Uh, uh, so a time scale which can be extracted uh, is much higher than compared to paraffin oil. But on the other hand, when you look at the 
building up, you see that the two are a lot closer to each other. So presumably what's being modulated in this case is only the uh, breakup time scales and not really the formation time scales. And uh, we did a fair amount of st systematic thing in terms of changing the particle percentage. You can change the temperature in this case because it's a melt and you can do experiments at 120 and you can do it at uh, you know, different particle percentage. And we see largely uh, you know, uh, expected effect that uh, when you increase the particle percentage, you see more uh, you know, structural breakdown in the system and so on. And so these are the two sort of models that uh, we used uh, to look at uh, uh, the overall uh, thixotropic system. Uh, one is based on uh, plasticity. And so therefore, a uh, kinetic hardening kind of a, a framework. Uh, the other one is uh, based on uh, uh, yield stress fluid, uh, based on this uh, finger uh, uh, strain that I defined yesterday and its evolution in the system, deformation. So rate of change of that uh, 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 deformation, this is more like an elastic and a viscous stress contribution. So it's a viscoelastic model. And uh, the, uh, the strain uh, is basically evolves according to, uh, based on you know, whether you are above yield stress or below yield stress. So it's a combination of viscoelasticity and uh, yield stress. So that's why it's called elasto-viscoplastic EVP kind of a model. So both of these belong to the same. If you look at the broad structure, this is you know, a derivative of stress and then uh, there is a term uh, associated with the stress itself and the strain rate. So it's a, some Maxwell type uh, viscoelastic model, but on that you have combined the fact that there is a yield stress in the material and then post yield, how the structure evolves is based on uh, uh, how much you are away from the yield stress that's present in the system. So, and, and both of these models of course have uh, uh, you know, three, four fitting parameters because some parameters you can sort of fix and assume them to be, or you can independently assess them, but three, four parameters you do have to fit. So one of the things that we were trying to do is to say that, you know, you fit one set of data and then you see, so step down you fit and then you see whether you can arrive at step up and things like that. And so this is something we've uh, sort of recently uh, published where we were looking at this polyethylene and uh, the uh, polyolefin data simultaneously. And uh, this shows, uh, you know, the example fits and it's far from, uh, you know, satisfactory. So even though the models look very complicated, the, the problem is that, you know, maybe we are not capturing uh, the, the physics the way it should be. And uh, the class of modeling that's going on may still not be the one which we should really look at. and. Uh, what we also noticed is generally uh, the uh, fitting can be uh, sort of isolated. So it's not clear sometimes when the fitting is done whether different parameters are being used for different classes of responses. In our case, we sort of tried to say that we'll fit the whole family together or we fit one set and then try to predict the other. And, and so both the models really don't uh, you know, uh, do a great job. They do somewhat satisfactory job of qualitatively showing they, they also uh, do not capture, for example, this, you know, the uh, sort of two-step increase that we see. One other uh, type of experiment which also is done is flow reversal. So you uh, shear the material at, let's say, five per second and then start shearing it at minus and then look at the stress evolution and these kind of systems. So uh, if you look at the rate constants uh, that we could evolve in terms of this K1 or K2, uh, we can see that, of course, the uh, uh, Brownian scale doesn't really change. But there is an order of magnitude change uh, in case of uh, one, uh, the reformation rate. And the breakdown uh, is affected also. And uh, one of the other things that we've been trying to look at is, uh, you know, what are the normal stresses in these kind of systems? And uh, this is still a challenging thing. So we have not yet uh, resolved this. This sort of just shows the data. 
at uh, different, so ARIES measurements we did, a, did it uh, NCL uh, with the help of Harsh Vardhan. And uh, then we have uh, Anton Parr and you know, different geometries and all of that. And uh, you can see that uh, in this range, yes, there is a repeatability of the normal stress measurements. So one of the things is that this is the range where thixotropy is important. And uh, it's not clear that normal stress is very significant in that range. Right? So the normal stress that arise in these systems, we, we were wondering if thixotropy has any signatures towards normal stress evolution in these systems. And uh, so we have done further measurements. In fact, uh, Ravi, uh, who, Ravi Teja, who is uh, doing this work, was in Greece also uh, to try to do more measurements. And we have, uh, we have seen some interesting features related to uh, these normal stress measurements, but we're still re resolving those, not, not really definitive as yet. So, so far uh, there is no discussion uh, related to normal stress variations in these, and uh, these models that I talked about are proposed as three-dimensional models uh, with, uh, you know, so presumably should be applicable. So we are looking at, you know, what happens according to these also to the normal stress signatures in the materials. And so if we, let's say fit, uh, so this we have fit now with shear. So now if I predict normal stresses, how close are we to the normal stresses predicted by these models to, you know, the experimental data. And our preliminary observation is that they're not very close. So which means there is some essential aspects of uh, physical mechanisms that are not really being captured in these uh, kind of models. So we may need to look at some different classes to really look at uh, these kind of uh, model systems. Uh, so uh, yeah. that high shear rate where you see this normal stress increase, huh. uh, do you see also the some shear thickening in terms of like if you plot viscosity? No, no, no. Shear rate it's, there is yeah, yeah, shear thickening. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So normally also for a polymer melt, uh, hmm. normal stress uh, sort of uh, goes as uh, you know gamma dots right. squared. So so therefore uh, that's what is normally uh, that is expected. Yeah. Okay. No, I was wondering this if fumed silica ha, particles ha, are, are they getting uh, clustered and yeah. uh, you know uh, jammed that kind of thing? No, yeah. uh, it doesn't okay. look it like. Yeah. Of course, the normal stresses are not present in the polymer melt itself because this is a low molecular weight polymer, so it's not significant. So it's true that the normal stresses are rising in the system because of polymer particle and uh, you know uh, particle particle uh, you know uh, mechanisms. But uh, still not clear as to what role does structural evolution have in all of this, and uh, how much uh, you know structural evolution can explain the normal stress signature. So that's still to be determined. Okay. Any other question? Uh, because, uh, sorry, uh, yeah. Follow you. So, because that high shear rates, they are the presumably the structures are broken yeah, already, yeah, right? Yeah, like right, 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 right. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so that's why uh, the thixotropy and the structure building and breakup may not have, uh, you know, which if you look at this data primarily, it looks like that. But we have also looked at the transients. See, this sometimes cannot give us full information about thixotropy, right? So ideally what we would like to do is to transition or do a startup uh, shear and then look at the evolution in normal stress as a function of time to really examine thixotropy in more detail. So which is what we have done and uh, now we are also trying to model that and put the two together to you know evolve an understanding. Because this does seem like that uh, yes there is normal stress signature but it is due to particle polymers being there mm -hmm. and not due to this structural evolution. Mm -hmm. Can I ask a question? Can I ask? Yeah, yeah sure. Uh, in the thixotropy plot oh, where you see some hysteresis uh, huh. in up and down measurement, right. uh, up to what time scale you, if you repeat this experiment, let's say, again right. and again, yeah, yeah. and do you think that the hysteresis should, the internal area should decrease, uh, or you, it is independent of the number of measurements? No, so, yeah, so those, those measurements are uh, uh, tricky to some extent in the sense that you know there is a time period between the two uh, measurements that you have to specify and uh, so what is seen in some materials is that the first thixotropic loop uh, will be different than the second and third 
but third, fourth, you reach some kind of a cyclic uh, steady state. But some other materials, first and second and third, are also identical. But and very rarely you will see that uh, first uh, you see hysteresis and then it disappears later on. No, because you see the time scales are such that, that there is building re uh, happening, right? So the extent of it may differ slightly from the first cycle to the second and third cycle in some materials. But in some materials you will see first, second, third cycle, all of them identical. But it will be rare that in the first you will see this evolution and the second and third you will not see anything at all. No, so if it's a thixotropic material, even in subsequent cycles you should see. A subsequent cycle you, you should see and it should not disappear. Right, yeah, yeah. It will, then it will never disappear, yeah. It will, so that's what I'm saying. There are two class of materials. In one case the extent of it may reduce, right? But it will not, so in the sense first and second may be different, but third and fourth will be identical. And in other cases, first, second, third, fourth, all are identical in terms of the hysteresis, amount of hysteresis that's there. So in fact, one engineers have one measure of thixotropy is just measure the area under the curve and call that yeah. the measure of yeah. thixotropy. Yeah. Now in that sense, uh, now if you correlate that factor to the normal stress measurement, let's ah. say, and you uh, mark point, there only you expect something, not the higher shear rate. Right. Uh, intermediate shear rate will... Right. Uh, what kind of things you are expecting? Because uh, I couldn't get that. Uh, no, so what we were uh, thinking, you see, there is a sample spanning network at the lower shear rates. And presumably when you are uh, going through these breakdown and rebuilding processes in the intermediate shear rate, you have this uh, sort of, uh, you know, larger clusters and smaller clusters and there is a transition between them. So. So therefore, uh, we, we, uh, you know, we were thinking, you know, what signature will that have in a normal stress, given that you have this variation of structure. So that was uh, what we were thinking in terms of, so we, we were thinking that you will start seeing significant normal stresses maybe during that time itself. I was not uh, convinced because while it is normal process increasing, yeah. okay, you can s give some ideology of why it's it is increasing or it right. is decreasing, we can think of why it is decreasing. Right, yeah. Now, I could, I didn't get if some changes happen, let's say, uh -huh. and some breakage happen, where is, there is no stretching, let's say, there is no... Uh, no, no, these are, uh, each of these measurements at some, it's a steady state measurement, right? So, there is continuous shearing on the sample. So, when we say there is a breakage and reformation, we are saying some uh, steady state which is reached, where there is an average cluster size or an average broken down is extent any? of a average breaking down, right? So, so that's the way it is. It's not, we are not looking at this, uh, at least in this plot, we are not looking at it as a function of time. In so that if, you, if we are looking at it as a function of time, we should do an experiment where we look at the stress growth. So uh, one of the things, uh, yeah, maybe I'll comment on it, uh, yeah, later. In uh, that sense, your, our resolution should be very less because right. uh, here the stress scale, I think it is very high enough because I think... Uh, no, also there is noise from the lower, right? The, since this is preliminary data and I've just taken the plot from Ravi Teja, what you see is the, uh, I mean, the, some of the values are very high, which is, uh, you know, associated with instrument noise at uh, lower uh, strain rates. So we're not really sure of uh, the reliability of the measurements. And so the plot looks uh, somewhat, uh, you know, because of that, the variations may not be very meaningful, but if you look at uh, some of these variations in this range, they may be. How, how do they vary? For a thixotropic versus a non-thixotropic system. It's a, that's another thing that we were trying to understand. How is the evolution of N1 with respect to shear rate? So uh, a simple upper convected Maxwell model or an old droid model, which are the simplest models which predict normal stress differences, say that N1 goes as gamma dot square. So how is this? scaling different compared to that. So those are some of the features we were looking at, looking at this picture right now. But transients when we look at, yes, we will get far more clear answers. In all the cases you use hydrophobic uh, yeah. uh, film silica? Yeah. Okay. So, but it still will have some patches of uh, SiO2, right? It's not completely uh, hydrophobic. No, because you are, your solvent is oil, mostly ah, oil based. Right, yeah. And your system is also hydrophobic. Badly uh, hydrophobic, yes. With <coughs> some amount of high patches, so therefore it leads to agglomeration. Otherwise, you should have a perfectly stable uh, dispersion, right? If it's a perfectly hydrophobic silica, 
then uh, it should be stable. Uh, I was expecting the similar kind of behavior. Yeah, no, but they cluster because uh, even though you are making silica hydrophobic, there will be, you know, patches of uh, uh, SiOH still remaining there, which uh, those are the hydrophilic patches, which can, you know, presumably lead to the clustering. Okay, yeah, thanks. Now, see, the uh, other thing, I mean, I didn't want to say, because we're still working on this and uh, still haven't published it. Uh, so, but uh, when you uh, look at the transients, uh, we are also seeing uh, the fact that it need, does not reach the same steady state every time. So, when, you, when you're doing this uh, steady measurements, we are seeing this nice evolution. But if I do transients and uh, say I start from scratch and then lead to a steady state, we are observing that there is a, you know, multiplicity of steady states. No, it reaches a constant value, but different runs gives yeah. us a different steady state. It should not be very, uh, every time it should not be a constant value. Yeah, it yeah, should, yeah. It should, yeah. should vary. So, which yeah. is unlike the shear stress, where the shear yeah. stress is reaching the same value, but normal stress is reaching different steady states. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, and, and there is some uh, sort of... Uh, quote unquote chaotic, uh, I mean, kind of, I mean, it's not really chaotic, but you, you're getting different steady states at each and every run that you are doing. And there is some work uh, which we saw, which reports uh, in a slightly different system. So we're still trying to make sense of the data. So the transient shows far more complicated. I mean, rather than transient resolving anything, it has added to our uh, sort of confusion in terms of what the system is doing. I, I didn't want that to be <laughs> because we're not sure. I mean, that that seems like a very somebody will say that oh, this you're saying chaos and this and that, and uh, you know, it, can, it does not make sense in this system. <laughs> Multiple steady states. Okay. Yeah. We can stop here. Yeah. Uh, the 3D printing I didn't say, but it's okay. Oh. Okay. Yeah. No. Yeah, so, the, so these are, I mean, when I, as I said, I scanned the literature and uh, these are the sort of 3D printing systems. I mean, there are people in food, you know, people uh, in, uh, so these two are examples from food. These are examples from, uh, you know, uh, geopolymer uh, networks for strengthening the soil. So a so whole lot of uh, different systems claim that, you know, we are trying to optimize thixotropy for uh, 3D printing. And if you look at, uh, the kind of measurements they are doing uh, to try to, uh, and they, there is a variation. So they, some of them are looking at in fact step change. So you shear for 50 per second and then go to 0.1 per second and then uh, look at the evolution. Some others are only doing this thixotropic loop that we talked about. Uh, and, and so there is a variation in these, but they claim that they are optimizing this thixotropy in their formulation, in formulation and then uh, they show that therefore 3D print is better in these kind of cases. So, so and uh, re uh, reasonably re recent literature, the last uh, two, three yeah. years literature basically. So 3D print, the requirement is like you need uh, like uh, high, high, high th thick no, low viscosity while it's coming out of the nozzle. Yeah. And, and then as soon as the drop, uh, it gets deposited, either a jet or a drop, hmm. it should solidify. Solidify. So yeah. that change should be... Rapid, uh, yeah. Rap so the structural yeah. building time scales need to be fairly rapid. Hmm. That's a lot of wall paint, right? Huh, yeah. Yeah, yield stress fluids is also fine. Yeah, yeah. Yield stress fluid is also fine, yeah. But then uh, uh, the they... they then see one challenge is the solidification if it's instantaneous what you have is the next layer of print coming on top and that needs to intermix with the layer which is already deposited so oh. if you have a perfect solidification then the intermingling between layers will not be very perfect so that's why perfect yield stress may not be as good as a rebuilding which is you know tuned is the claim i mean some of this is still you know largely still being understood So we'll stop here and resume in the afternoon. Yes.
Yeah, we'll uh, break for lunch now. Lunch is arranged in the same place. It's library, uh, above library. So we'll start again at uh, 2.30. 2.30.